Let me read to you a passage from the 13th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 31 to 35. It's the Gospel for Thursday of the 30th week in ordinary time. St. Luke writes, At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go and tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will attain my end. But for today and tomorrow and the next day I must keep going, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. So be it, your house will be left to you. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from Luke chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. What does it suggest to us? Well, it suggests things about real success. You know, Peter the Great demonstrated a far-sighted vision for Russia, and many have maintained that it was he who set the nation on the road to being a modern state. Many other examples could be given of persons who, having attained great prominence in society and with the forces of society now at their command, displayed great insight and ability. In such cases, though, their civil powers and their achievements, for good or for ill, depended on their securing and retaining positions of influence and even dominance. Peter the Great was impressive precisely as one who was in full mastery and seemed to be so. So too with Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar long before him. Without their military and political power to impose themselves, what would they have been or done? Their success was visible and enforceable. Thus we may say, it has always been. It has always been like this. Success is visible success and failure is visible fa failure, or at least so it is deemed. In modern societies, the influence of the media is proverbial. When Pope Paul VI visited Sydney at the end of 1970, among the groups he addressed were the journalists. He told them that they were world power number one. Now, in the media's presentation of the world, politics and economics, there is nothing like success to be successful. There is nothing like failure to be a failure. However, all this can be a house of cards for all the props of success in these terms can suddenly crumble and this we often see. A question we should ask is, is there a success which is not dependent on social approval, adulation or coercion? Indeed, is there a success which comes forth from evident failure? In a word, is there a success which is open to anyone? in any and every circumstance. Can a person be successful in the midst of a very ordinary life or a life of manifest failures or even opprobrium? To answer such a question we may think we may think the matter through in a philosophical fashion or we may look to examples. Both are important but examples convince and inspire the imagination to action. In our Gospel passage today that I read earlier, the Pharisees come to Jesus and urge him to flee because Herod was after him. Perhaps the Pharisees had been told this by the Herodians, and we have instances in the Gospels of the Pharisees and the Herodians colluding in their opposition to Jesus, though there were Pharisees who were secret believers, such as Nicodemus. Perhaps the Pharisees of our Gospel passage today were testing the courage of Jesus or hoping to see him on the run. 
Christ knows that the forces against him were growing and closing in on him. As he would say to the twelve at the Last Supper, the Prince of this world was on his way. Our Lord's seeming success was draining away, and the spectre of failure, in visible terms, was looming large. Let us notice, though, there is no panic in Christ, no confusion, no radical change of course in order to retrieve a, a crumbling dream. <clears throat> On the contrary, the vision splendor grows as the apparent failure grows. Success looms in proportion to the looming failure. He can see, he knows, and he teaches that it is failure that will give him the victory. His rejection by those who matter is the way his mission will attain its end. It is precisely the cross which will take him and all others to glory. No matter what the circumstances might be, Christ possessed the key to success. It had nothing to do with visible success or approval, adulation, or the position, or the possession rather, of the means of influence and command. Now this is a resounding message to the ordinary man of history, the man of numerous failures and disappointments, the man who has nothing of the means of success as ordinarily regarded. Herod was after him, but Christ knew that this mattered little. What mattered was doing the will of his heavenly Father and completing the work. He, not others, he, the Father, that is, gave him to do. Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will attain my end. His end, his success, is attained by doing the will of the Father. Let us not be distracted in ways we may not fully realize by the standards of the world. Let us not allow to lurk deep within our imaginations an image of success, success in life that is worldly, dependent on what is seen and approved by others. Let us look to Christ and his preeminent example. The only success that matters here and hereafter is that which is accounted such by God who sees all. Success is the success which Christ sought and most assuredly attained. And he did this in the midst of seeming failure. Indeed, his failure was an integral element in his success. He had to undergo the cross in order to enter his glory and to bring all others into glory with him. Let us then, for love of him, take up our cross every day and follow closely in his footsteps.